Take your Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. While you're doing that, I'm going to do a little rearranging up here. To... That was crowding me a little bit. It seemed a little odd. 1 Samuel chapter 30. We are in a, a series entitled Rise and Fall. We're looking at kingship within ancient Israel and, and, and seeing God's work through Israel's kings and, and learning off of that what God has for us even as believers today. Today's message is entitled, Finding Strength in the Lord. Finding Strength in the Lord. One of the, uh, the hallmarks of athletics, uh, sports, I mean, you could take this into the political realm, you could do this in all facets of life, uh, where there is an opponent or, or somebody that you're uh, in competition with. <clears throat> and one of the, the hallmarks of competition is when you see in your opponent weakness or you see them fading or you see them kind of losing stride. What do you do as the one who is in opposition or in competition with them? You what? You pounce on that. You go after that. You try to take advantage of that to your own your own advantage. Uh, the tennis tournament that's going on right now in the world is, is Wimbledon, and uh, one of the fascinating things about tennis that I've always enjoyed is it, it really is a competition of one against one, and it's, it's a back and forth, quite literally, as the ball goes back and forth. But uh, in, in that competition, if, if, you, if you pay attention to tennis, things ebb and flow, and, and momentum seems on one's side, and then it can kind of wane. And, and, and the really good, effective champions of tennis jump at that opportunity to take advantage of their opponent when they see that break or that opportunity to, to get the advantage. And that's exactly how life seems to work, whether it's in competition or life itself. Spiritually speaking, we are in a world where there is spiritual attack and there is a spiritual opponent and there is opportunity in the midst of, of us being down or us being uncertain or us faltering that our spiritual opponent would love to pounce at that moment, attack at that moment and take advantage of the situation. Life itself can even at times team, seem to work this way. And that's exactly what David was experiencing in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Although outside the promised land, aligned with his enemy, the Philistines, marching to face his own nation in battle, wondering how this would resolve itself, probably planning to do something in the midst of that to save face, David experienced the providential, protective, and patient, as we saw last week, care of God over his life. God rescued him out of that, pulled him out of that situation, didn't allow him to march against Israel. Through the Philistine leadership, actually told David to go back to the town in which he occupied. But put yourself in David's shoes in that moment. He doesn't know... This was God doing this in that moment. He doesn't know, oh, God's plan is for me to go back here and God's going to take care of Saul and this. And God. He can't see that. We know that because we have the written record of it. But in the moment, I, I have to think David thought, what is going on? I, I'm sure this was what I need to be doing. And now all of a sudden, it's completely reversed and I have no idea what's next. And there's uncertainty and there's probably even still a bit of, of wavering in David, and he's, he's returning with his men now to this town that they've occupied for over a year, still outside the promised land, not fully understanding what God is doing or what God was going to do. And it's in this moment of uncertainty, and it's in this moment of, of distance even from God, that David would now have his faith tested even more as he returns to this town of Ziklag. Notice verse 1 of chapter 30. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day, marching back three straight days to this town from the battle, from where everything was happening, being kept from it. And the narrator then introduces the Amalekites once again. The appearance of the Amalekites 
should trigger us, the careful reader, to recognize that something is going to happen. This is the enemy of Israel. They've been popping up all throughout 1 Samuel, both with Saul and with David. Saul failed to deal with them. David plundered them just a few chapters earlier, taking advantage of them. And now they appear again, and in some way they're going to tease out this contrast once again between David and Saul. God's going to do something through David toward this perennial foe of Israel's. But what is the Amalekites? Why? What have they done? The Amalekites had raided the Negev. That's the region that Ziklag's in and the towns there and Ziklag itself. They had attacked and burned it and had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. Most likely taking revenge for David's recent raids and plundering of them. The Amalekites take advantage now of David's absence and they invade Ziklag. They invade this region. They plunder it. They capture its inhabitants. And they take with them everyone. Verse 3, when David and his men reached Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters taken captive. Everything is taken. Uncertain as to what God is doing. Why are we going back here now? Upon arrival, they get there and everything is gone. The city is burned. All their stuff is gone. And most importantly, their families are gone. And they have no idea where they are. We're told the Amalekites did this. David and his men at that moment don't know who did this. All they see is complete ruin. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no more strength to weep. That is severe mourning. To mourn to the place where there's no more strength to keep crying. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel, Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David was greatly distressed. Yes, the situation, yes, the loss of all of this, but on top of that now, the men who were with him were talking of stoning him, each one bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. I mean, you can see the rationale here. They've followed David. It was David's logic that led them back out of the promised land to ally themselves with the Philistines over this last year. It was David's idea to plunder this region, to take advantage of this, to march with the Philistines. They're following David, and now they come back, and everything is in ruin. And they turn to their leader, and they are about to stone him because it's his fault, and in many ways, it is his fault. His scheming had led them to this predicament. Crisis now turned to absolute destitution. Simply because God's chosen, like David, experience God's providence, God's protection, God's patience, as we saw last week during a very difficult situation, doesn't mean that life will now all of a sudden turn to the better. In fact, it's at some of these times that more testing might come, and it might come immediately. As Dale Davis reminds us in his commentary, sometimes you're in the pit, and you think you've reached the bottom, and then the bottom drops out of the pit. And that's exactly what David was experiencing. We get no promise in God's word that when we're going through trials, we'll get physical relief from them in a bit of time. That's not promised to us. In fact, if you look at Job's example from the Old Testament, Job suffered, and then Job suffered worse, and then Job suffered worse, and then that continued for a long stretch of time. It didn't get better. God may at times choose to allow this. He may not. He might step in and intervene, but he may choose to allow his chosen ones to experience increased trial. Why would he do that? Because what do trials ultimately do? This is the New Testament perspective that we get to bring to this. First Peter, 
trials, testing, they prove the genuineness of one's faith. Sometimes God does this to prove, to prove and make known the faithfulness of his people in the midst of trial. And that's where this story turns. Notice the, la the last sentence there of verse 6. In the midst of all of this calamity, in the midst of imminent stoning, David found strength in the Lord his God. It's the main idea for our message this morning that amid life's crises, believers find their strength where? In the Lord. In the midst of life's crises, believers find their strength in their Lord. David's faith proved genuine as he turned towards the Lord and found his strength there. Not in himself, not in his own abilities to get himself out of his jam. What does that mean to find one's strength in the Lord? To strengthen in the Lord. Well, let's talk about what strengthening in the Lord doesn't mean first. Strengthening in the Lord is not some magical formula that you can conjure up and just say the right words, right? Like, if I, if I say the prayer correctly, I can make God do certain things. I'll get stronger in my relationship to him. And some people... Some people conclude this, right, when, when things go from bad to worse. Maybe I'm just not praying the right way, or maybe I need to do more. It's not that. It's not a quick fix. It's not a simple solution. It's not something that's going to come immediately. This strengthening in the Lord. It's not a, a turning back simply to religion. i gotta, I got to get in church more now. You see, Jesus doesn't work like a, a genie in a bottle. You can't rub the lamp and Jesus comes out and we get to tell him what to do and he'll fix it and make it all better. That's, that's not how Christianity works. Nor is this simply letting go and letting God. Sometimes that's the mentality. Well, I just, I'm just going to give up and give it all over to God and it's just going to happen. That's not David in this text. That's not finding one's strength in the Lord. It's encouraging oneself in relationship to God through his promises and his presence. That's what we see with David here. It's encouraging oneself in relationship to God through God's promises and God's presence. God's past faithfulness was remembered by David and David turned to God. In fact, this same language is used earlier in 1 Samuel 23 verse 16 when David was, was experiencing incredible pressure in his pursuit by Saul to end his life. It says in verse 16, in the midst of that severe trial, that Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. Jonathan showed up and encouraged David and reminded David of the promises that he had made, God had made to David, about what God would do through David. And, God, and Jonathan strengthened David in the Lord. This is the same thing I think David is turning to here. It's a return to the very promises that God has made to him and finding his strength in God's word, God's presence in his life. Desperation may drive us to God and where better to be driven than to God himself. He'll remember this in Psalm 27, verse 14, when he pens those words to wait on the Lord and be strengthened in the Lord in the midst of his trials. Believer, how do we do this today? How do we find our strength once again in the Lord? There's a couple of passages in the New Testament that I think really speak to this well. One is Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. It precedes that whole section on the armor of God. But that is introduced this way. Finally, be strong, strengthened in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God 
so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms that need to be withstood and stood against. But how do we do that? We be strong in the Lord. The other one is found over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, a similar command that Paul gives to Timothy toward the end of his life. You then, verse 1, 2 Timothy 2, 1, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard of me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable people who can be qualified to teach others also. It's, again, it's, it goes back to this word of God. But both passages have the command to be strong. But there's an odd thing about that command. The command is in the passive voice. Usually when we think of a command or something that we are to do, that's active. You do it. But here is a command to us, and it's the same idea of David here, where it's passive. Be strong. How do you do that? How do you be strong? Do you just conjure that up? Do you just set your mind to, I'm going to be strong, and so it's a matter of willpower? I don't think that's it at all. The command is that this is going to need to be something that you depend on, that you rely on, that strengthens you. Who's going to do that strengthening? It's going to be God. We know that. This is what it says in 1 Samuel, but it's also the implication of Ephesians 6 and 1 Timothy. It's something that the armor of God builds into us as we wear it to withstand the spiritual battle we are in. It's something in 2 Timothy 2.1 known as the grace of God that we lean into that's made available to us through the gospel. It's one of the reasons why the gospel is so important for us, not only to be saved, but to strengthen us in this race that we are on, the work that Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. You see, strengthening comes through resistance, and strengthening comes as something presses back at us. I mean, if you've done any level of, of weight training or endurance training, right, I still try to stay in shape somewhat. I uh, have a, a workout routine that I involve myself in a few times a week. All of that has strength resistance in it, right, to build strength. There's a, a weight whether it's a body weight or uh, weights themselves of some kind that are there that are resisting and causing resistance as I go through a certain exercise. It's how am I strengthening myself? Well, that, that weight itself is being utilized to build strength. Endurance is the same way. If you run or you train toward a run, you don't get endurance instantly. It's that, that constant, repetitive going through over time that builds the resistance. It builds the endurance in us. You see, the trial is really the weight. It's the pressure, the circumstance of life that tests and push, pushes against. And as we rely on God and we press into God and we use his method of finding his strength, it strengthens us and it builds endurance in us for this race of life that we are on. And it proved the genuineness of David's faith. Because when David's faith was ultimately tested, where did David turn? He turned to the Lord. Well, it took desperation to get him there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because it shows what was real. What was really at the core of David. And it reveals what's at the core of us, believer, when those trials come. So how do we get this strength? What is this means of finding strength in the Lord? Well, 1 Samuel shows us two of them. And they're, again, these are so basic, but we need to be reminded of them. The first one is a turning to God or prayer. The means of finding strength in the Lord begins with prayer. Then David, verse 7, said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod, and Abiathar brought it to him. We haven't seen Abiathar in quite some time. He showed up back in chapter 23. In those earlier occurrences of Abiathar, he was there as a means that David could inquire of the Lord. He could ask the Lord for direction, and again, that's what he does here. 
the Lord will manifest himself to David and direct his steps. In fact, David will inquire of the Lord, verse 8, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? He asked the Lord two questions, and notice the Lord gives him three answers. Pursue them, you will certainly overtake them, and you will succeed in this rescue. God not only gives him the answer to his two questions, but then he guarantees him success, which enables David to press into this, knowing God is going to do something here. question comes to us, can we assume that David didn't inquire of the Lord between this occurrence in 1 Samuel 30 and 1 Samuel 23? Has David not talked to the Lord since then? That's a couple of years, if maybe not more. Now, we don't know. Maybe David talked to him in his own prayers and stuff like that, but bringing Abiathar out and talking to God and seeking God's direction, Usually when God enters human history and reveals himself, that's going to get inscripturated, meaning it's going to show up in scripture. So I think we're fairly safe to assume God, David has not tapped into this for quite some time. And I think it shows us how easily we can wander or drift from the obvious position of proximity that we should have with our God. We've used this illustration before, but I think it's so appropriate. Folks, our, our life as Christians is like a boat floating in a current. A boat floating in a current is always drifting. Your life is always spiritually drifting. But think about it this way. The anchor, the thing that keeps you moored is, is God. It's the promises of God. He, first, uh, Hebrews 6 brings that analogy out. He's the, the sole anchor for us. But here's the reality in a current. Are you ever drifting really toward the anchor? No, if there's current, it's always pulling you what? Away from the anchor. You're always drifting away. And in life, spiritually, you will never be drifting spiritually when you're lax, drifting towards God. That's not how it works. You're always spiritually drifting, and that spiritual drift from the pull of this world and the pull of our flesh will be away from God. We sing that song, that I think it's in the third lyric of, of that song, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, right? That, that idea of our, our soul, even as we sing to God and praise God of, of how great our God is, our heart and our soul naturally and fleshly drift from our God. And let me suggest to you this morning that prayer always seems to be a very powerful barometer of where we are in relationship to our God. When our lives are marked by an absence of prayer, I can almost assuredly tell you that you are drifting away from God. If our prayer life is lax, if we aren't spending time in prayer, if that's something that you are not regularly doing, you're in a place of drift and it's not toward God. But here's the beauty of this, and it even reminds us of this in this passage as well as elsewhere. As a believer in Jesus Christ, your God is still readily available. He is still there and he will listen the moment you enter his presence again in prayer. He is wanting and waiting to hear and run toward his drifting children, to pull them back toward himself, to renew their strength once again. We don't have a priest like Abiathar. It'd be great to have somebody we could just go and find and discern the Lord's will. We don't need a priest like Abiathar. We have a great high priest who is much greater than Abiathar or Melchizedek or the greatest priest who's ever lived. His name is Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 tells us that. We have a great high priest who is right at the right hand of the Father, readily to make intercession always for us, probably interceding for us even when we're spiritually drifting away from our God. And we can come boldly into the presence of God through him, our intercessor, to find grace and help in our time of need. That's Hebrews 4. So our means of finding strength in God is turning to him in prayer. That's exactly what David did. 
to strengthen himself in the Lord. But secondly here, off of this promise that he receives from God, you will surely overtake them and you will succeed in this rescue. David now acts on that word that is revealed to him and that's the second means I told you this isn't rocket science here people it's prayer and it's the word our second means of finding strength in the Lord is living according to the revealed will that God gives us and that's what David does in this passage David and the 600 men with him verse 9 came to the Bazor Valley where some stayed behind 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley But David and the other 400 continued the pursuit. They've been marching for three days. They've been mourning for the entire day at least. And now we're going to get up and we're going to pursue the enemy. This is not an army that's in a position to go to battle. 200 of them have to stay behind. But they found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. And they gave him water to drink and food to eat. Notice David's just... Him and his men are just going. They have no idea where the Amalekites are. They don't know where this plunder is necessarily. Where are these raiders? They just start going. They come across this Egyptian. He gets all kinds of food here. Cake, pressed figs, all this stuff. He hadn't eaten and drank in three days, three nights. Once they revived this guy, they asked him, David asked him, who do you belong to? Where do you come from? He said, I'm an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill Three days ago, and we raided the Negev of the Carathites, some territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. This is the guy they needed to come across, right? This is exactly one who was there. David asked him, can you lead me down to the raiding party? This guy's not stupid. Swear to me by God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master, and I'll take you down there. So David promises him that. Let him down there. And there they find the Amalekites scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking, reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day, and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David only showed up with 400 to battle. All that's left after the battle is 400 more. Now the odds are actually even. Shows you how much this wasn't David's doing, this was God's doing. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought everything back. He took all the flocks and herds and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. When David made inquiry from God, God came back, not only with instruction, but assurance that he would be successful. Do our prayers get answered in such a direct way when we seek God's guidance? I don't know that we can quite expect that level of direct revelation from God. But God's revelation of his will is revealed for us in his word. And that gives us adequate instruction on how to proceed with life as well as the assurance, folks, that we need to know that we can confidently proceed along God's way. If we follow God's path, that way will lead to eventual victory. It might not lead in victory the way we want it in this life, but it will lead to victory and success for God's will in this life and the next. God's providence can be seen all over David's life here as he follows God's promise here. How did they know where to go? How did they find the Egyptian slave? How did any of that occur? That's God. God is still providentially in control. God is still doing and accomplishing his will. God's providence shows up all the time in life. My mind is wandering here, so I'll just say it. But I mean, we don't know what's ahead in our nation, and we can get all. But if you don't think God's providence last night, like, turned the head of a former president just a millimeter or two or three, or I mean, that's bizarre stuff, right? And I'm not saying that to say what that holds for the future, but God's in control, so we don't have to worry. 
And however he does that, whether a guy is taken out or not, somehow God's going to still remain in control and accomplish his will. David understood that. David followed God's providential control. And while it might appear to be luck at times or coincidence, we as believers know better that our God remains in control and he will direct the steps And this is us as believers, we can have this confidence. He will direct the steps of his chosen one who submits his way to the Lord's leading. God does that. It might look like David is simply doing life. He was, but at the same time, he is submitting once again to God's ways, God's instruction, God's guidance, God's presence over his life. And God's providential protection and guidance directs his path just like it will direct ours if we simply submit our ways to God. We trust him. We turn to him. That doesn't mean you're going to escape every difficulty in life. It doesn't mean that everything for your family is going to look successful from the world's point of view. But submitting your ways to God will allow God to use you as he deems best. And that's ultimately what we are, vessels of God's use, jars of clay for him to shine his glory through. David's confidence in God's word to him enabled him to pursue the Amalekites despite the difficult odds, the tired men, And from all appearances, David and his men should have been routed, but like Gideon before him, they saw through David's trust and dependence on God, God win an amazing victory over his enemies through small numbers. And that's what happens to the people of God when they live according to God's will. God does incredible things. This is how we're strengthened in the Lord. By turning to him in prayer, by Entering regularly into his presence through his word and allowing his word to guide our steps. And one who finds their strength in the Lord not only finds it by these means, but then there is evidence in the life of the one who is strengthened in the Lord. And that's the the second thing that I want us to see this morning as we close down. Not only the means of finding strength, but what is the evidence that God's strength is there? In the aftermath of the Lord's victory over the Amalekites through David, David demonstrated his finding strength in the Lord in two ways. The first of all is that he shared shared God's grace equally. He shared in God's grace equally. Notice verse 21. Then David came to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow him and who were left behind at the Bezor Valley. They came out to meet David and the men with him. And as David and his men approached, he asked them how they were. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. I mean, it's understandable that the men who fought in this battle were a little bit frustrated with the guys who stayed behind because they were probably exhausted as well. And we had to go rescue your families. But David didn't see it this way. Notice verse 23. David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. That's the key phrase. This is not what we accomplished. This is what the Lord has given us. He has protected us. He has delivered into our hands the raiding party that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. And David made this a statute and an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. You see David acting very kingly here, making a very decisive decision in the moment. But what he's basing this on is in that this is the Lord's victory. And in the light of the Lord's victory... A move where we decide that we can hold on to God's grace and others shouldn't was very self-centered and unmerciful. And as recipients of God's mercy toward them, delivering his chosen one from this crisis, David thought that all should share equally in God's grace. God had given them what they possessed. He had won the victory. Who were they then to believe that they were more deserving than others? It's almost like that child. I can remember this from 
childhood growing up, but also my own children, you, you're, you got that sibling who's in close age proximity to you, right? And it, the birthday comes. And the parents, you give the child the, the birthday gift, and it's the new toy, and they love the new toy, but what is the sibling thinking there, right? Like, the sibling wants the toy too. The sibling wants their turn to play with the toy, and that's completely understandable. We as parents have so, ju- you know, tried to make all things equal. We even on the one's birthday give the other kid a gift, right, just to keep them happy. But eventually, you got to teach the kid the sharing, and, and, and eventually the turn's going to come that even though the gift is bestowed upon you, both can use this thing, both can enjoy this thing, both can share in this. David and his men did not, David recognized, accomplish this. This is, this is the beauty of it as a parent, as you're sitting over that illustration with the two children, and the one saying, mine, it's mine, and the other is getting mad because they want to play with it, and you're sitting over the thing going, it's really neither of yours. I bought this, right? And I gave it to you. And David was the one who awoke to that reality. Guess what, guys? We didn't win this battle. We should not have won this battle. God won this battle. And in the grander scheme of things, God's going to be fighting a battle in the next chapter with Saul through the Philistines to wipe out Saul and bring David and his men to prominence and leadership in the nation. And that's going to be none of their doing. They're not even going to be present at that battle. God's the one who is giving here. Our obedience and perseverance should never make us feel as if we deserve God's grace more than others. Why? Because we all fall short of God's glory. We were reading Romans 2 and Romans 3 uh, with our, our 25 below group this last week, and we were teasing out chapter 2 whereby you get to chapter 2 of Romans, and, and, and the Jews are pretty excited about how God, uh, Paul just condemned all the Gentiles at the end of chapter 1 there. And then Paul turns the mirror back on the Jews and says to them, what are you guys bragging about here? I mean, you guys commit all of these same sins. Your, your law does nothing for you. It, God shows no favoritism. All are going to be judged based on works, and all are going to fall short based on works because no one measures up to the glory of God. That's who we are as sinners. But as grace's recipients, the work of God, we receive God's mercy and therefore should share God's salvation for all who come, no matter their background, their ethnicity, their lifestyle, their sinful choices. Because such were we apart from God's grace, and yet he has chosen to save us without favoritism, based on the response to his son, Jesus Christ. And that work was on the benefit of all mankind. Evidence of finding strength in the Lord is a willingness to share in God's grace equally to all. And lastly, a sharing God's grace generously. Notice 26, when David reached Ziklag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah who were his friends, saying, here is a gift for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. And David sent it to those who were in Bethel and Ramoth and Negev and Jatur, to those in Aurora, Shifmoth, Eshtemoah and Rakal, to those in the towns of the Jeremalites and the Kenites, and to those in Horma, Bor, Ashan, Athok, and Hebron, and to those in all the other places where he and his men had roamed. You see, David and his men had roamed through a lot of these regions already and had probably been provided for by a lot of these people. And so when David receives the plunder, he doesn't hoard it to himself. He sees it. Now, maybe politically, there might be some political motivation here, but at least his mind is to generously share this with those who've helped him. Generosity should characterize those who experience the grace and mercy of our loving Heavenly Father. When you are blessed by God, Here's a question. Do you consider others and how to generously give to them or simply see the blessing as something that now I get to spend on myself exclusively? We need to remember, as David did, that all of this belongs to God and he has chosen to give it to you. And as an act of worship, we should be generous with our monies to support those among us 
who may need it when we experience the blessing of God. I don't think this is a communism. I don't think that's it. But it is a recognition of what God has given and a willingness to be generous with that. As an evidence of one who is finding their strength in the Lord. All of this reminds us once more of the main idea of this text. Amid life's crises, believers find their strength in the Lord. As we close this morning, I'm reminded of just that idea once more back in verse 6. David was greatly distressed. The last time that verb occurred in 1 Samuel was actually back in 1 Samuel 28. In verse 15, when Saul goes to see the witch, right? And Saul says this to Samuel when Samuel asks him, why have you brought me up? He said, I am in great distress, and the Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. So I've called on you to tell me what to do. It's the same word. Saul was under great distress. And Saul turned to any means necessary to find revelation, find information, find what he should do. Crises for believers, folks, serve as an opportunity for God to work through his chosen ones if they turn to him. The great distress of Saul and the great distress of David had two very different outcomes. Saul disguised himself and sought his own way, only to receive the message of imminent destruction. But David turned to the Lord and found his strength in the Lord, and the Lord was there. becomes a paradigm for how we are to find our strength in the Lord. What are some practical responses to this this morning? I, I, I think and I'm reminded, hey, we, those disciplines of prayer and the word are things we need more of in our life. They need to be a regular part of our life. We need to get into God's word more in community with our fellow brothers and sisters. David was strengthened in the Lord by Jonathan earlier. His community as others came around him and reminded him of the truths of God's word. Promises of God to him. So if you're looking to how to strengthen myself in the Lord, plug in, push in, connect into those areas of study where you come around the word of God in prayer and community with one another. If you're not involved in a Bible study or in a small group or something like that, see one of us. Let us know. Send that in. Go online. Fill out the little thing. I want to get plugged into one. We'll plug you into one. Some of you think, well, I'm in a weird situation in life. I'm not like the typical family and all of that. I might be somebody who's single, and uh, do you have something for me? Yes, we have a, a... a burgeoning singles group that we would love to plug you into. Some of you are saying, well, I'm, I'm a lot younger. Yes, we got 25 below, right? Heinrichs are right over there. We would love to plug you into that. There's plenty of opportunity at all stages of life to get plugged into an area of community that can help you take in God's word, that can come alongside you in prayer to build these disciplines. But another practical response that I think all of us can make is that issue of generosity to use the money God has provided you with more wisely. Some of us struggle with that. How do I do that? We're going to have an ABF coming up in about a month, not even quite, on faith and finance and how to use the resources that God has given you toward that end. So mark that on your calendar. Pay attention to that. But we would love to come alongside you and help you practically with the word of God to how to manage well so that you can be generous with what God has provided you. We've put up over the last couple of weeks the opportunity, and you can still find this online, to <clears throat> how do I get plugged into service here to use the gifts maybe generously that God has given me within the body of Christ? Well, there's ways to discover that, and we'd love to walk you through that. But don't walk away from a message like this and not, and not think through, how does God want me to respond to find my strength in him today? There's plenty of opportunity. We'd love to sit, walk alongside you in that, pray alongside you to that end. Because our strength is not in ourselves. Our strength is not in our situations within this world. Those are going up and down. Our strength comes from the Lord. And we want to aid you in that process. Let's pray to that end and let's introduce this as well as we close this morning, our Lord's communion. Lord, we come before you 
thanking you for your word, thanking you for its truth. Thank you for the reminder, powerful reminder from the life of David. That, that, that life isn't always going to just get better because we came out of one difficulty. It might, the bottom might drop out. But Lord, that's the opportunity to really prove the genuineness of our faith. Not in our ability, but because the Spirit is there. Because Jesus Christ is at work. And that Spirit is ever interceding. And Christ is sitting at your right hand, ever interceding on our behalf. Even in times where we can't even express the words to pray. What confidence that we can never be separated from your love toward us. And so Lord... I pray for those who might be in a position of spiritual drift this morning that are are pulling taut that, that, that line that tethers them to the anchor that is you. Lord, grab their attention. May they press back in to your word, to prayer, to the community of faith that can bring them back to the anchor that is Jesus Christ, that is you and your word in our life. And Lord, may we find strength in you. And in this community, Lord, may we we be a people that is marked not by affluence, not by success, but Lord, may we be people that are marked as those are genuine followers of Jesus Christ. May that testimony ring forth and may it be seen in our lives for your glory. Thank you for this opportunity to gather even at this moment at your table. May this, Lord, be a time as we reflect, as we confess, as we ask you. We search, Lord, into your presence that we find strength even here to hold us up, to to take that step, to reach out, to to find, Lord, how we can find our strength more effectively in you for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name this morning.